So my uh, talk will focus on the resilience of uh, complex networks. Um, I may repeat some of the things I said before by uh, Shlomo and Simi. I try to make the uh, talk as self-contained as possible, um, but I will uh, probably spend most of the time on uh, new things, uh, some of them more classical and some of them recent results. So let me explain what I mean by uh, network resilience. Um, the main idea is that we start with some graph uh, which represents a network in the real world. So this is an example of a graph. And then we remove nodes according to some ordering. Let's say I remove this node and then this node and then this node. And I look what is left. And the idea is that we mainly consider the resilience of the network according to how many nodes need to be removed before we are left with a very uh, small component. Usually in the thermodynamic limit where n goes to infinity, we ask when do we have something which is little O of n. So it is, does not scale with the size of the entire system. Why is, what is it good for? So this is important, for instance, for the robustness of infrastructure. We want to know how robust our infrastructure networks are. Uh, it is important for understanding the stability of various processes. And it is important for immunization of uh, human populations and computer networks, uh, which will, uh, on which I will expand a little uh, during the talk. So what kind of graphs interest us? So usually, if you want to model things, you don't want to look at specific graphs, but we want to look at models. Uh, the most basic and uh, well-known model for a random graph is the Erdeschreni um, random graph, which means that uh, basically this is actually a, a variant of the original model, but is also usually called the Erdeschreni model. We start with some n uh, nodes, and for each pair of nodes, we add an edge with some given probability and independently of other edges. So this gives us uh, some model um, for uh, creating random graphs. And the idea is that uh, this model is democratic in the sense that every edge has the same probability and every edge is independent of the others. It is random. Um, and it is a very simplistic model. Um, one of the key results is that if we look at the degree distribution, which is the number of edges uh, emanating from each node, we get a Poisson uh, distribution. Uh, another result that is uh, well known is that uh, some uh, networks, some graphs, are uh, large worlds, in, uh, meaning that um, when you look at the distances between a, a random pair of nodes, for instance, we get very large distance. For instance, here, for this uh, grid, if we look at two nodes which are more or less uh, on the uh, opposite uh, sides of the grid, we get distances that are uh, of the scale of square root of n. If we add the shortcuts, we get already uh, distances that are logarithmic in the number of, uh, of nodes. Um, and we, if we look at a completely random graph, then also the distances are logarithmic. So what is known for random graphs? And I'll explain how those results were transition um, when the average degree is one. If the degree is less than one, we get no giant component. So all components are small. If it is more than one, we get a unique giant component. And if it is exactly one, we get some fractal behavior. Again, I will give more accurate um, explanations later. 
Uh, we also know the size of the giant component, which I will again explain later, and the behavior in EP are scale free. This, this means that, that they have very uh, a high degree, you know, usually um, term the hubs. And uh, most nodes have very small degrees, uh, many times just uh, of the order of many, uh, but rather they behave differently. Um, whereas the uh, uh, degree distribution of the Erdos-Remi networks is uh, uh, a Poissonian types of uh, networks, um, there are many types of networks, but many networks in the real world do not behave like the Poisson model. The Odushreni I model behave um, as scale-free networks, meaning that a few nodes have very high degree and most of the nodes have very low degree. Um, and this was noticed around the year 2000 uh, when studying many real world networks. So here's an example. If you look at the road network uh, in the uh, United States or in any other country, uh, then we see that uh, any uh, city uh, has a very similar number of uh, highways uh, connected to it, usually somewhere between one and five, six, and no more because um, there are ge geometric limitations. Whereas if we look at the flight network, uh, the airplane route network, we see that there are airports uh, uh, more of a, a of flights, uh, regular flight lines going through them, and many airports that have only one or two, which are regional and local airports. Another network that behaves like that is the internet. The internet uh, has many hubs uh, in which there are um, just a, a few, uh, a, there are many connections and most uh, the most local networks and uh, and the uh, end uh, user computers on the internet have just a few or even one um, neighbors. And similarly for biological networks and social networks and so on. Uh, here's another thing that was uh, discovered uh, again around the year 2000. Let's say we look at a uh, virus survival. Uh, this is for computer viruses. Um, as you can see, the, this is a study of uh, several viruses and the, uh, um, and the time uh, scales of survival are very long compared to the time scale of infection. You can see here time uh, length of survival of up to, let's say, three years, um, whereas infection can be very, very fast. And this is a not uh, well explained by the standard theory that says that uh, the growth should be either exponential or exponential decay. So looking at uh, the Erdos-Renyi theory, it uh, appeared that a new theory is needed. The degree distribution, the distances in networks which are logarithmic in uh, erdos renin model but uh, actually scale like log log n in many real world networks and not uh, are not uh, logarithmic and looking at epidemics again we get that uh, the epidemic threshold is very close to zero meaning that epidemic can almost always prevail and remain for a long time and you can see that for some diseases, uh, you need to uh, immunize almost all the population in order to stop an epidemic. 
all of these were um, mysteries until uh, it was suggested that a new model is needed uh, and the Erdos-Schrenny model uh, is a not a good description of actual uh, real-world systems. So here's some idea by um, Barabashi and Albert that try to explain how networks are formed which are not uh, Erdos-Schrenny. And the idea is that there are two uh, necessary ingredients, growth and preferential attachment. Growth means that the network is not static, nodes are added um, once in a while, and each such node uh, is connected to previously existing nodes. And preferential attachment means that the nodes are not uh, connected to just random nodes, but rather have a preference towards high degree nodes, towards nodes that already have many neighbors. Uh, this can be done due to copying, uh, choosing the uh, popular nodes, or uh, it can be done uh, via other uh, mechanisms. So here's a new node and it is connected to existing nodes. And you can see that in this case, it really has chosen high degree uh, nodes. And the barbashi albert model gives a degree distribution which is not, um, not Poisson, but rather it is a, a power law. You can see that it has a power of three. Uh, the number of nodes with degree K decays as K to the minus K. Um, we will use in this lecture the configuration model. Uh, for those who have heard uh, Simi's talk, uh, he has uh, expanded more about it. But I'll explain the main idea. The idea is that we start with n nodes. Um, we add stubs to each node according to the degree. So we decide for each node what will be its degree. And we add uh, stubs, sort of a half half edges to each of them. And then we add the random matching on the stubs. So basically we choose pairs of such stubs and we connect them together. So here's a pair and here is another pair. And here we have connected all of them randomly. It's a random uh, matching. And where the uh, mathematical requirement is that if the configuration is illegal, for instance, we connected two uh, nodes more than once between them, then we will just uh, restart everything from the beginning. And eventually, um, a, after a fixed number of tries, we will get a, a legal configuration. So let's start talking about percolation theory, which is the main, um, main, uh, main uh, subject of this talk. So the idea is that we start with some graph. In this case, it is the grid. You cannot see the lines very well, but uh, they are there. And then we randomly remove some fraction of the nodes. Let's say 30% in this case. Um, and as you can see, we receive a, a, a network in which a, the, um, there are missing nodes and the edges that belong to them are also uh, removed here, and the, uh, uh, the remaining uh, network consists of two um, components. One is small, having two, uh, two nodes, and the other one is pretty large. If I remove, uh, but we, we say that the network survives because um, we have a um, we have a large portion of the network remaining. Uh, after we move 50%, in this case, you can see the network uh, breaks down components. So if we look, we get a, a, a graph of the, a, a, as you can see, we get a graph of the size of the largest component as a function of the removed number of nodes. We get some sort of a phase transition uh, phenomenon, meaning that if we remove some critical fraction, 
Um, in this case of the square read, read it is about 41% of the nodes, we get that everything uh, breaks down into very small components. Now, if I uh, look at this as a social networks, a social network, sorry, in which uh, a, an epidemic can spread, then if some individual uh, becomes uh, infected here, and it can infect all its neighbors, I get that uh, the uh, epidemic becomes pandemic, so everybody um, is infected. In this case also, if one of the individuals in this large component is infected, then I get that the epidemic is uh, still in endemic state, meaning that many of the individuals uh, become uh, infected. Whereas in this case, regardless of where the epidemic starts, I get that only a small number of uh, individuals are infected by uh, the spreading. So here's an example example for square grid. You can see here that a, a few of the nodes are removed. We get that the a largest component, the red one, dominates almost everything. And if I start removing more and more nodes, you can see it shrinking until I get a small component, which is not of the a, same a, a scale as the entire network. Okay, so maybe um, before I continue, uh, I'll see Dana, can you do, are there any questions? Uh? Okay, let's see. No, uh, nobody raised his hand, so I think it's okay, I can continue. So I'll continue, good. Okay, so let me uh, expand a little more about uh, percolation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Robin. There is a question, okay. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, what are those parameters space? What, what do those parameters say? Space, yes, parameter space. Uh, you mentioned space parameter maybe in the last slide. A phase transition. Let's see. One second. Um, okay, ah, the, what are those parameter space? Okay, so okay, so basically um, for the uh, percolation, there is only one parameter, which is the P, the probability of a, a, of a node to be removed. So this behaves somewhat like temperature in uh, statistical mechanics. Um, this is the only tunable parameter. And the uh, face and the order parameter is usually chosen to be uh, the size of the uh, the relative size of the giant component uh, divided. That is the size of the largest component divided by the system size. It is zero if we are in the disconnected phase, and it is greater than zero if we are in the connected phase. And also, if I, I haven't mentioned that, but if you look at the um, the graph here, you can see that percolation, the percolation phase transition is um, a second order phase transition, meaning that it is, a, a, it is continuous. Um, the, uh, in the case of a network of networks that uh, Shlomo spoke about this morning, the transition can be also a first order, and I think uh, maybe Amir will speak about it tomorrow. Okay, any other questions? Yes, another, another question. Uh, what needs to be the size of the largest component until that graph is considered broken? Okay, so usually uh, the definition is based on the phase transition and the size of the uh, giant component is this largest component, sorry. And once it becomes little O of N, meaning that it does not scale with the system size, it becomes, uh, it is considered uh, broken. So it is not well defined for finite networks. And usually we just use some rule of thumb, say uh, when the size of the giant largest component is square root of n or log of n. But uh, for the uh, limit, the thermodynamic limit, um, where we take n to go to infinity, then it is well defined mathematically. 
Okay, thank you. And about the connection between percolation, epidemic, and immunization. So, what's the idea of the connection between percolation and uh, immunization epidemics? So we start with the graph. This graph can, for instance, represent the social network, who interacts with whom. And uh, this uh, social network is a, a, the network by which a, a epidemic can uh, spread. And if we immunize some of the population, we can model that by node percolation. So basically we start immunizing people, we remove them from the network because they no longer can uh, uh, get infected and thus they can no longer infect other people with the epidemic. Um, and now let's say if an epidemic start, then we can model that by edge percolation, specifically, um, and maybe there will be more expansion about that tomorrow, in the SIR model, well, um, each individual can only be infected once and once it is it it recovers, it cannot be infected again, at least not uh, in the uh, small time of the epidemic spreading. So in this case, we can decide for each edge with some probability it can cause an infection and with some probability it will not cause an infection since not every interaction actually becomes infectious. So remove some of the edges. And then uh, if a giant component exists, then the epidemic can spread and become endemic. So now let's ask, okay, we have a graph. We want to understand what happens when we immunize it, when we remove some of the uh, nodes. For instance, in this case, we have a graph, we removed some of the nodes randomly uh, with some probability P. And then we ask, um, when does a phase transition occur? And another model can be, okay, let's say we do not just randomly remove nodes, we just target the high degree nodes. This can be a model of uh, intentional sabotaging an infrastructure network, and can also be a model for uh, immunization, which is based on immunizing the most uh, uh, influential individuals, uh, people that have a lack of interaction with other people. So in this case, let's say we remove a fraction of the nodes, but not uh, intentional attack is the case where we target the most influential nodes in the network and try to use that in order to, um, to uh, break the network much faster. So where here does the phase transition occur? So here is some uh, simulation results and I'll explain later how they can be analytically explained. Um, so if we uh, look at the scale-free network with a small lambda of less than three, we get that uh, there is no critical threshold. You can see here that when the network size become larger and larger, we get that the uh, threshold um, approaches one meaning that even if we remove close to 100% of the nodes, and in the limit of n goes to infinity, this is exactly 100%, we get that uh, the, um, there is still a giant component whose size is proportional to the entire network. Whereas if we take lambda larger than 3, we get that um, there is a finite percentage at which there is a phase transition. However, if we do intentional attack, we uh, remove the most highly connected uh, nodes, we get that uh, the network uh, disintegrates very quickly. We just need to remove a few percent, depending on the exact details um, of the nodes, and the network completely disintegrates into small pieces. So let's try to explain how this can be uh, obtained. Um, so uh, I'll start by uh, introducing branching processes. So branching processes are uh, stochastic processes, random processes, in which we start with some uh, 
individual cell, and then it has um, it has offsprings, and the number of offsprings is a random uh, variable, meaning that uh, there is some distribution, and uh, the offsprings are chosen randomly from this distribution. In this case, it has three offsprings, and each one of them again uh, has several offsprings. They can have a uh, zero offsprings or one or more and this goes on and on uh, for each generation and the question that can be asked is uh, how long will this go on will this ever stop um, what is the distribution of uh, the number of, of, of uh, descendants after some time etc so what does it have to do with the network so um, for a random graph, if we start with some node, we can look at its neighbors and neighbors and neighbors of neighbors and so on. And uh, this behaves very similarly to a branching process. This behaves like a tree. Because as long as we haven't seen a large portion of the graph, the probability that there will be um, loops is, uh, sorry, cycles is very small, meaning that um, uh, each one will have different neighbors than the others. So we start with some small, uh, small component of the network, and then we look at one of its um, one of its neighbors, and we ask how many neighbors will this one have. Um, so basically what we want is for this one to have at least another neighbor except the one that we have reached it through, since uh, if, if it has less than one, then the process will die out if it has zero uh, neighbors. Um, so the average number of neighbors depends on the degree of the node. And interestingly, if we uh, choose a node this way by reaching it through um, Going through a link, through an edge, it is not a random node, meaning that not every node will be um, accessed this way with the same probability. For instance, nodes with a very um, low degree will have a very low probability of being reached uh, by this process because um, there are just a few edges through which we can reach them. Whereas nodes with high degrees uh, will be much easier to uh, to arrive to this point. Uh, thus, the probability uh, of reaching a node with degree k does not behave like a 1 over n, but rather like a k over n, the, uh, the degree of the node um, over the average degree uh, times the number of nodes. And if we look at the average number of neighbors of a node reached this way, the average number is not the average degree, but rather the uh, ratio between the first two moments of the distribution, between uh, the average of the square degrees and the average of the degrees. Uh, if this number is greater or equal to two, uh, this means that uh, we can go on with this process for ever or at least for a very long time um, the number two is due to the fact that we have reached it through an edge and then we want to use another edge to get out if this number is smaller than two then we get that uh, we cannot continue uh, for a long time and we exponentially decay and um, with a probability one we will stop after a few num a, a small number of uh, nodes. Um, so this criterion boils to for a, a, an early Schrodinger graph. Uh, if the average degree is one or more, then we get that there is a giant component, so more than one. And if it is less than one, then we get there is no giant component. What happens if we remove some of the nodes? then this probability distribution changes and we can recalculate it and get the critical threshold. I will explain later a more um, systematic method of doing it, 
but um, I'll, I'll give the main uh, result here, which is that if the ratio between the second two moments is infinite, which happens if the second moment is infinite, which is true for scale-free networks with lambda less than three, if you have probability distribution of k to the minus uh, two and a half, for instance, then the, um, the average of k squared becomes infinite. Um, and then we get a, an, a, an infinite uh, kappa, which means that there is no threshold. If the lambda is large and free, or for uh, the Shreni and this kind of networks, we get that the uh, threshold is finite. Okay, so I hope this was clear. So let me uh, give some uh, um, introduction to the method that is best uh, suited for understanding how this behaves. So this is the method of generating functions. So in general, uh, what is a generating function? We have some sequence of numbers. They can represent, for instance, probabilities, P0, P1, P2, etc. And then we can define the formal power series which is the uh, sum of these uh, uh, numbers, uh, each multiplied by the appropriate uh, power of x. And this is an infinite sum, or finite if, if the number of uh, numbers is finite. And then if we have some uh, recursion equation, for instance, relating these numbers together, we can make it into a self-consistent equation which will be um, explained soon. Um, and an important thing to notice is that if we put g of one, then uh, this sum just boils to the sum of the p's, um, which can be one, for instance, if, if they are um, normalized. And if we take um, the derivative of the power series g and evaluate it at one, we get um, the average or the expected, uh, expected value for this uh, series of uh, probabilities. So how is this uh, connected to graphs? So let's suppose we have a graph with a given degree distribution. We define a formal power series where the coefficients are the uh, uh, probabilities for the different degrees. And then we can define another one, G1, which is the probability for the given degrees, but um, if they are reached through a, a following an edge. And then what we can do is that we can write a, a self-consistent equation describing the size of the branches. So suppose I have some branch each branch can be either just a reach a single node and then it has no uh, offsprings and we are done. Or we can have um, one offspring which leads to uh, another branch which behaves exactly like the original one. Or we can have two offsprings leading to two branches, um, three and so on with the appropriate probabilities. And then we can define a generating function for the size of branches using this. This age one of x is x, which is stands for this um, initial node, um, times g1, the distribution of number of uh, offsprings of this edge, um, uh, times uh, each, each evaluated at the same branch size as the original one. Uh, now, if we want to look at the cluster size, we start with a random, uh, not a, a, a random node not chosen by uh, the distribution, but rather chosen uh, randomly from the graph. And then we look at its degree distribution, and this gives its number of neighbors. Each one leads to a, a new uh, branch. Um, so evaluating this at one gives um, the, uh, the 
uh, size of the giant component, since this gives this, the uh, distribution of the size of small components, if we put one, we get uh, the total uh, sizes of small components and what is left, one minus that, is the size of the giant component. And this can be adapted also in case we have some probability of deletion of each edge, we can add some probability of deletion. Specifically, if we evaluate that and put in a G0, uh, the Poisson distribution, we get the exact formula for uh, Erdős-Renyi graphs. So let me um, just uh, uh, show a, a small example. Hopefully this will be uh, clearer then. Suppose we only have two possibilities. Each individual can either have no offsprings or two offsprings. Um, so let's say the probabilities are three quarters for having no offspring and one quarter for having two offsprings. Each of these offsprings leads to a new branch which behaves similarly to the original one. So we can write a self-consistent equation, x, the uh, size, the probability of leading to um, a finite branch is three quarters in case we just follow it and reach a node with no offsprings, plus one quarter times x squared. So this is the probability that we have two offsprings and each of them leads to a finite branch. So we solve this simple uh, quadratic equation and we get two solutions. We always need to take uh, the smaller one of these solutions. In this case, it is one, meaning that the probability that the branch is finite is one we will always reach a finite branch since we have a higher probability of having no offspring than of having two, uh, then the size, of the probability of uh, having the branch uh, um, survive for a long time decays exponentially. However, if we reverse the probabilities, one quarter and three quarters, um, then the equation has two other solutions, one third and one, and now one third is the uh, solution, the least uh, solution, meaning that there is a probability of one third if we start from a node, there is a probability of one third that it will lead to a finite branch, and two thirds that the branch that it will lead to will be infinite. Okay, so maybe uh, are there any questions before I continue? Yes, there is uh, one question. Um, can epidemics be modeled as a branching process? Okay, so the answer is like graphs, uh, it can be modeled as a branching process. However, uh, notice that the branching process has a finite uh, validity meaning that if we start a early first, okay, there are two restrictions. One is uh, we assume that the networks are um, random. Of course, uh, networks are not exactly random. So there are many small cycles in the real world. Everybody in a family, for instance, or in the same classroom, usually have interactions with everybody. So we need to uh, compensate for that. Uh, the second restriction is that the branching, uh, uh, the distribution of number of new neighbors is true only when we look locally and when the epidemic starts spreading, but once it has reached a large portion of the population, then it is um, already the, the branching uh, coefficient becomes smaller since we have a high probability of having someone infect someone who has already been infected or a was uh, already been seen. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the effect, the uh, correctness of the branching uh, argument uh, becomes uh, uh, less uh, exact. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, no more questions? So. Okay, so I'll... Um, 
give a, I'll be brief about uh, the idea of universality and critical exponents. So basically, uh, if we look in physics and mathematics, um, one of the uh, most um, important uh, properties of a critical phenomenon is that they seem to be uh, universal, meaning that if we look at uh, the critical behavior, the behavior uh, near a critical point, then uh, it seems that it is not uh, dependent on the microscopic uh, details. For instance, if we have uh, a square grid and a triangular grid, if we look at the critical point, the behavior will be very similar between them. The critical point itself may be different, but near the critical point in, in a way that I'll explain in a moment, the behavior is the same. However, this is not true um, when we change the symmetry, for instance, if we move to three dimensions, or if we have a, a, a not a, um, a grid, but rather a, some a, a stochastic a process, some a random graph or whatever, then we get that uh, the behavior becomes quite different. So um, let me speak about what criticality means. So basically, if we look at the critical exponents, meaning the behavior near the critical point, then we get uh, some uh, critical exponents. For instance, uh, the most well-known one for calculation is beta, meaning that if we are close to the phase transition, then the size of the giant component behaves like P minus PC, the difference between the, um, the concentration and the critical concentration to some power beta. Um, in the mean field approximation, it is well known that this beta equals one. This is what happens when you have high dimensional grids, uh, say over six dimensions. Uh, for two or three dimensional grids, we get a different number there. Uh, however, for scale-free networks, we also get different number there. It turns out that the uh, existence of hubs has a strong influence on this. So this is, a, you can see the results here, they depend on the lambda. And also, if we look at the distribution of the small components, again, there is a mean field behavior, which is well known. The number of components of size S behaves like S to the minus two and a half. Um, however, again, this is changed for a different lambdas. Uh, and the behavior near the uh, phase transition is also a uh, fractal. Um, for instance, the size of the giant component does not scale with n, like uh, above the, uh, exactly at the critical point, it behaves like, like n to the two thirds, whereas above the uh, critical point, it behaves like n, and below it is logarithmic in n. So there's a special um, a fractal behavior exactly at the critical point. So what is this behavior near criticality good for? So let me give you some application. So suppose we are driving in heavy traffic. And here is a very uh, unpleasant example, maybe not so relevant today. Um, so uh, we don't want to get stuck, we want to get to our uh, destination as quickly as possible. So for instance, what we can do is use some sort of uh, an application that chooses the best route for us. How do these things work? So basically they look at the graph of distances and they search for the path that has the minimal um, distance between the uh, source, which is where we are now, and the destination, which is where we want to get. So for instance, if we want to go from A to B, we can choose the uh, short path having only two edges, which is A to C to B, but this has a price of eight, or we can choose the longer path, A to D to E to B, but this, ha this has only a price of seven. 
Okay, so this is um, the uh, behavior, and we can uh, distinguish between two kinds of behavior. We can have either weak disorder, which means that um, all the terms are from a narrow distribution, and usually the shortest path will be also more or less the shortest one in terms of the number of edges we span and strong disorder in which uh, there is a very wide distribution of the uh, prices of the times, for instance, that it takes to um, uh, move across some edge. And in this case, a single term, the higher, highest uh, cost uh, term, uh, dominates the entire sum. For instance, if you want to broadcast uh, through the internet, then the narrowest a link between us and the destination determines um, the uh, bandwidth that we get. So what does uh, um, the application for choosing the route do? So there are several algorithms. The most well known is Dijkstra algorithm, which means that we start with the source um, we uh, put each of its neighbors in a queue. Each of them gets the cost of uh, going through the uh, edge. And then we take the one which is closest to us. We color it red, meaning that it is now known how to get to it. And then we look at each of these neighbors. If we got, if we got to a neighbor that was already uh, in the... Um, in the list, then we look if the new route that we find to it is um, less expensive in terms of time, for instance, than the previous route, and then we change the cost. And we continue until, all the, uh, until the destination is reached or until all the nodes are ready. However, what happens if we have strong disorder? In this case, we have a simpler uh, algorithm Let's suppose there are very, very um, jammed uh, edges in the network. What we can do is we say a very jammed um, edge is something we never want to go through. So we could just cut it from the network. And then once we remove that, we can remove the next highly jammed um, uh, edge and continue and continue and continue. However, we need to make sure that uh, if there is some edge that is necessary, since we cannot reach, for instance, this edge is necessary to reach this node, I hope you can see my uh, pointer, um, then we need to guard it and make sure it is never cut in order to um, have every node uh, reachable from um, the original node. So you can notice that this is very similar to bond calculation, uh, but I do keep uh, the edges that disconnect the network. So, um, so what does it mean? It means that if I use a strong disorder, um, if I have a strong disorder distribution, um, then the behavior of the uh, distances between points, they have just like a um, percolation at criticality, meaning that the, the distances scale like n to the one third and not like log of n um, for, uh, not for this, not for this uh, um, grid, but for random networks. So here's a real world example. I just took it um, from calculating the, uh, least cost a uh, route from Tel Aviv University to Bagalan University. You can see here that the route with, that was chosen was much more um, a much longer in terms of distance than the uh, shortest uh, route. However, it was the uh, least expensive one in terms of travel time. Okay, so before I move uh, on, let's see if there are any questions? The question, so the question is, can we use the um, KKT, the Kaushkun-Tucker uh, condition for minimizing the travel time? 
and the files I can tell the Karush Kun Tucker is appropriate for, um, for problems which are continuous, uh, in which the parameters are continuous. However, here we have a, a, a binary problem for each uh, edge. We need to decide whether we go for it or not. We cannot have a, a, a fractional solution. And I think the KKT will not work in this case, although I am not sure, but I think it is not appropriate for this kind of question. And another question from Alexander. Why we assume self-consistency for the branching ratio? Um, so uh, the answer is, and this is related also to the question that was uh, asked before, um, let's say I start with, let, let's start with a branching, with branching process and not, a, not necessarily a network. If we have, um, we start with a node and then we look at the descendants, then we have some distribution of the number of descendants. Suppose we have two descendants, each one of them has a more, more a, sorry, two, two offsprings, but two direct offsprings. Each one of them has more offsprings and the distribution of the number of offsprings of each of them uh, is the same as the distribution of the number of offsprings of the original node. So what we get is the distribution of the branch sizes that uh, emanate from them is exactly the same as the uh, distribution of branch sizes of the original node. Uh, if we look at the network, this is again true as long as we are local. If we have already seen a lot of the graph, this is not exactly a branching process, but in order to look at all the finite components, which is what we want, we can use a branching process. Uh, the infinite component, uh, the giant component, is and um, does not behave exactly uh, as a, as a branching process. However, we can determine its size by looking at the size of the, um, of the, all the finite components and subtracting that from the entire size of the network. Um, so in terms of converging to the uh, uh, mean value, so uh, as I've, um, shown before, let me return to this uh, slide maybe. So the process is uh, determined by the ratio of the first two moments of the distribution. Um, uh, this is obtained by just doing the actual calculation of the uh, degree distribution or of the generating function. And when we do that, we get that uh, what is the most important parameter is the ratio between these two moments. And once the moment is, uh, the second moment is infinite, we get that um, the system is uh, very stable for at least for random removal. Um, of course, if we do intentional uh, attack, what we do is remove initially all the all the hubs in the network, all the high degree nodes, and then the second moment becomes finite. Um, if the moments the the moments are finite, both of them, this is true for gamma more than three, then we get that this is the parameter that determines where the uh, probability is. This ratio is actually uh, the average number of neighbors uh, of a node uh, which is arrived by uh, following some edge, some random edge. Um, so there's a, a saying in, in, in the network community which says that you are not special, but your friends are. If I just look at a random person, they are not special, they have uh, the the um, expected degree of uh, any random individual equals the average degree of the entire network. However, your friends are, if I choose someone by knowing that he's friends with someone, uh, then I know that uh, he was reached by following an edge, 
And in this case, each average degree can be much higher, uh, even uh, approaching infinity in case of a very high degree and a very broad degree distribution. So I hope this answers the question. I, I, I hope I understood it correctly. Okay, so will we continue? Okay. Thanks. Okay. So let me reach my last topic which will be on optimal shuttering of graphs. So until now we have spoken about uh, randomly removing the uh, uh, nodes or targeted removing, which uh, uh, was uh, targeting the highest degree nodes. However, we can ask uh, um, a more uh, holistic question, which is, um, we have random breakdown and we can remove nodes just randomly. We have intentional attacks, say by degree, by between a centrality, which is a, a measure of how central is a node, a node sorry, um, to uh, the network, uh, attacks with partial information, etc. Um, and you can see here some comparison of different attack methods. However, we can ask, if we are very smart, uh, how well can we do? Can we do much better than these strategies? And um, we can ask, how low can we go? Yes, how uh, small can be the uh, fraction of nodes that we remove in order to break the network into small pieces? And specifically, um, what is the optimal shuttering method? If you want to remove a portion as small as possible from the network and break it, for instance, if we have a, a, a limited amount of vaccinations and we want to immunize the population as well as we can, uh, how many uh, ratios do we need in order to um, make the entire uh, population uh, immunized? For instance, we can ask, uh, can this be a zero fraction of the entire system? Can we remove just, let's say, a square root of the number of nodes? Can we uh, immunize, let's say, a square root of the number of people in a country or in the world and receive a herd immunization uh, against epidemic spreading? So this uh, may sound uh, far-fetched, but in fact, it may not be that far-fetched. For instance, suppose we have a square grid. Uh, if we remove nodes randomly, we need to remove a, around 40% of the nodes. Um, however, uh, we can be smarter than that. So attack by degree also does not uh, contribute everything because the degrees here are constant. Uh, however, if we are smart, we can uh, remove just a very small fraction that uh, approaches zero. Let's say remove every uh, uh, quartic uh, um, root of n, and we remove full rows. So we get that the entire network is integrates into small pieces. This is, for instance, what is attempted uh, uh, for the um, a quarantine uh, policy, meaning that you quarantine people to small ge uh, geographic area and try to separate between the areas. This uh, allows to uh, block uh, an epidemic from spreading. Um, but this is in the case that the network is very geometric, meaning that no person goes uh, between different regions. Um, and this is true actually for any planar graph, not just reads, and this was known. 
So um, let's say we have a, a random network and we want to uh, shatter it by removing a minimum number of nodes. Um, formally, we can ask what is the minimum number of nodes uh, in order to break it into small, little of n components. So one observation that we can uh, use is that if we have trees, then shattering them is easy. Why is that easy? We can always find one node in the tree that breaks it into uh, components that are less than um, half the original number of nodes. So if we want to break it into pieces that are at most uh, n over 2, we just can find one node that will do the job. And now we can do it recursively for each of the remaining trees and break that down also. Eventually, we can get to very small components by breaking just a, a, a negligible fraction of uh, the nodes. Um, so uh, this has implications that it does not matter so much what is the size of the components you want to break it to, since all small components in a random graph are trees or close to trees then it doesn't matter if you want to shatter it into pieces of size square root of n or in n over log n or log n, this will all be more or less the same. So let's look at the simple case of random regular graphs. These are just configuration model where all degree, when all uh, nodes have the same degree. So they are locally tree-like, um, however, and this is a, can be bad news for a, a immunization. There are good expanders, meaning that if we look at a small, a, a small component, it has many neighbors. So can we use these properties to say that the optimal shattering is bounded away from zero? The answer is yes, we can. And this is good news for protecting infrastructure, but bad news for immunization. If we have a random graph, then we need to remove many uh, nodes in order to immunize it. So let's look at some bound on how low can we go, and this is based on an expansion uh, argument. So let's take, for instance, a random regular graphs. Locally, it looks like a tree, only when I look very far, I start seeing uh, edges that connect uh, between nodes that I've already seen. So suppose I want to break some small piece of this, uh, of this uh, uh, tree, then I have to remove all the neighbors of the, the uh, piece. However, the number of neighbors in uh, graphs that are look like uh, this, the graph that are um, expanders, uh, is proportional to the size of the piece I broke. So if I calculate the uh, sum of um, the uh, number of nodes that I deleted and uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, the sizes of the remaining uh, components, I get the total network size. Uh, however, um, there, there is a ratio between the number of deleted components and uh, the, size, the sum of sizes of the remaining number of deleted sorry, nodes and the, size of si the sum of sizes of the remaining components. And this is due to the fact that each uh, deleted uh, node can have no more than d neighbors. And eventually what I get is the number of nodes that need to be deleted is proportional with this proportion ratio to the total size of um, the uh, network, the total number of nodes, uh, where the ratio is the, uh, in this, for this um, random regular graph, the degree minus two over twice the degree minus two. So for instance, for D equals three, this gives one quarter, I have to remove at least one quarter of the nodes in order to uh, break the system completely. This is still much better than one half that is 
it, that is obtained if we remove them um, randomly, but this is still a finite fraction of the population, and this means that I cannot immunize the network without removing many nodes. So here are some experimental results. So for a three a regular graph, you can see that this matches exactly this bound. And for sorry, a higher degree, there is already a gap between this bound and um, the exact result. So I'll give a second bound, which is sometimes better than the first and sometimes uh, less good. Um, and this is based on the idea that after shattering, the graph is uh, fragmented into a collection of trees or tree-like structures. And now uh, we know from mathematics, easily understood that each tree can be two color such that no two neighboring nodes have the same color. Yes, we just color one node red, and then its neighbors black, and its neighbors of neighbors red, and so on. And there's there are always no two neighboring nodes that have the same color. Um, each color is an independent set in the uh, graph, since um, uh, it has no neighbors, uh, that have the same color. And independent sets are sets of nodes that a uh, no two nodes are a uh, such that no two nodes are neighbors. Um, so there are no limits on the size of the independent set. And since the uh, coloring here consists of two independent sets, the red set and the black set, we know that the number of removed edges must be at least uh, the size of the graph minus twice the size of the largest independent set. On the other hand, every independent set is itself a, a shattered graph. So if you remove everything except for an independent set, then of course the graph is shattered. And if you want, we can also add a little more to that. So basically this gives a bound that the number of nodes that needs to be deleted is somewhere between the number of nodes minus twice the size of the independent set and the number of nodes minus the largest independent set. And for random irregular graphs with large degree, the size of the independent set is asymptotically known. And this gives some bound on in the uh, size of the shattering, optimal shattering set. In fact, we know for large values of D, um, this upper bound becomes exact. This is the uh, right answer. We have to remove everything except more or less an independent set. And this is also true for large, uh, for the Schrenny graphs with large degrees. Um, so let me skip that and I just reached the algorithm and there I'll end. So let me give two approaches to finding an optimal shattering set. So the first approach is to find uh, the maximal independent set. This is easier said than done because this is an NP hard problem. This costs a lot of computational power and it is uh, not tractable for a reasonably sized graph. However, it can be approximated. We can find something which is not the maximal, but some approximation of it, say half the maximal size. And we uh, leave this intact. We don't delete that. And actually we can add a few other nodes uh, as long as we don't get uh, clusters that are too large for us. And then we remove what is left. And the problem, as I said, is that finding the maximum independent set is pretty hard. So let me give you another, a, skip that, another approach. And this is, suppose we have the graph, let's find the Hamiltonian cycle in the graph. So this again is hard um, 
for uh, general graphs. However, it is not to be easy for random graphs. There are polynomial algorithms that find the Hamiltonian path. Hamiltonian path is a path that goes through each, um, each uh, node exactly once. So you can see an example here, this is the Hamiltonian cycle. It goes through each node exactly once and it uh, returns, covers the whole graph and returns to the original path. So what, we, what can we do with that? So let's take this approach. We start with a Hamiltonian path. So the graph can be represented as a Hamiltonian cycle plus some shortcuts. The shortcuts are the one appear in the middle. So we organize the nodes according to their place on the Hamiltonian cycle. We start with some node and we go, okay, we find them, follow the Hamiltonian cycle. We go along the Hamiltonian cycle and then we look for a backward pointing edges. So backward pointing edge is an edge that goes to a node that we have already visited. For instance, this one, this points backwards to somewhere we've already visited. We continue. And once we have seen the second backward pointing uh, edge, we remove the node that uh, uh, at which we have seen. And then we go and repeat that. We go all over the cycle. We find all the backward pointing nodes and we remove every node that belongs to the second backward pointing um, edge. Eventually, what we get is something that is almost a tree. We can look at each segment here as if it was a single node. And since every segment only has one edge that points backwards, then what is left is more or less a tree. Now, this tree can be uh, removed, uh, can be broken, sorry, using just a, a zero part of the uh, nodes. Um, so this can be made uh, mathematically exact, and it can be shown uh, that using this method, we get shattering. Now, specifically, if we look at three regular graphs, exactly a half the edge which is pointed point backwards, since we see every edge twice, once when it points forward and once when it points backwards, and we remove half of them, since we remove every second backward pointing, so we removed exactly a one quarter of the um, of the uh, nodes, and then we only I need to remove a zero fraction in order to break the network uh, completely. Um, for regular graphs with higher degrees, this is harder to analyze, uh, but this gives some other linear approximation to the uh, size of the optimal shattering. Okay, so I'll uh, finish here. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you to everybody uh, who listened.